Good morning and welcome to Upland Community Church. My name is Pastor Dan Blosser. I'm the associate pastor here. If you're visiting with us, we would love to greet you. We have people in the foyer that have lanyards and there's an information desk, but the pastors would love to greet you. Please don't hesitate to introduce yourselves. This morning, we're going to talk about how Jesus is greater than Moses, that his faithfulness exceeds even the faithfulness of Moses. So Brighton and the choir are going to get us thinking about Moses, and we're going to sing about the faithfulness of our Lord. So if you will stand and join me in the call to worship from Lamentations 3, we will talk about the faithfulness of our Lord. This I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. For the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he cause grief, he will have compassion. He will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love, for he does not afflict from his heart. Amen.
Let's pray together. Father God, we are so grateful for your faithfulness. We thank you for the grace and love that you so richly bestow on us. Father, we thank you for Jesus and all that he means to us, for his great faithfulness that exceeds even Moses. Father, we recognize that there are times in our lives where we think maybe we can earn or have earned your grace and love to us where we serve you only for what we gain out of it. And so, Father, I pray that we would confess that this morning, that we would forsake that, that we would be washed over by your grace, knowing that you bless us when we don't deserve it. Father, none of us is worthy, but we thank you that Jesus was worthy that he is the chief cornerstone, the builder of the house. And so, Father, I pray that we would serve, that we would follow Jesus out of gratitude for the grace that you have richly bestowed on us. Please make that our hearts today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Would you please stand as we continue singing our Lord, to our Lord and Savior. Oh. 
Please be seated. At this time, I'm going to invite the children to come up for a children's message. You can come right up here. Great. Come on up. It is really good to see all of you guys, and I was wondering if maybe you could help me out. So I got this. You see what this is? Legos. They're Legos. And I was trying to decide what I would do with all these pieces, how I would put them together and make something. So what do you think I should do? How should I do it? How should I do it? What do you think? Maybe I could build an airplane. I don't know if I've ever built an airplane before. Is it okay if I just kind of guess? It is okay? Okay, well, this is not going well. So <laughs> what if I, an airplane, well, actually close, it kind of looks like a helicopter. What if I just started putting the pieces together? Do you think that would work? No. There should be instructions. Are you telling me it came with instructions? It could come with instructions. If it came with instructions, is it best that I use the instructions? Well, what if I don't want to use the instructions? Because there's some pieces in here that just don't seem that important to me. I think I ought to use the instructions, don't you think? So, look. There's the instructions. They're all there. You know, this is a lot like us because there are so many different pieces in our lives. And it is really hard to guess how they all fit together. But guess what we have? We have an instruction book. We have an instruction that helps us understand how all the little pieces, all the little things that happen to you, how they begin to fit together to create this glorious picture. And it's not that good of an idea to guess and just start putting it together on your own. It's better to, like you said, it didn't it come with an instruction book. The designer, the creator, the one who made this created an instruction book 
so we would know how to put it together. The one who made this and this and this has an instruction book that'll help you know how all of your life fits together. But what do you have to do? You got to read it. You got to know what's in it. You got to learn it. And that's what we do. Please pray with me. Father, we are thankful that you do not just leave us on our own to wonder how all of the pieces in our world fit together, but you give us an instruction book to help us know who you are and how by your hand you put each piece into place. Father, I thank you for each child here. I pray that you may open their eyes and their hearts to the truth of your word. In your name we pray. Amen. You are now dismissed to junior church. You kind of realize how dependent you are on children saying the things that you hope they'll say. So. <laughs> but I thank all of you parents out there that have taught your children well, and they do understand. So we're thankful. It's good to listen as they teach us all. So please bow your heads with me. Father, creator, Sovereign God of all that is, all that was, and all that will ever be, I would ask that you would humble us now as we pray. Your authority knows no boundary. In you, there is no uncertainty. There is no one who can limit you. You never have a contingency plan. The wonder of your greatness, the vastness of your knowledge is beyond understanding. In our days of wondering and confusion, you are the rock of ages. For with you, every day that you establish is like a thousand years that you ordain. You know the end at the beginning. You are preparing us now on this day for all that is yet to come. Your grace is glorious. Your hand is strong. Your word remains certain. Your forgiveness is complete. Your will is forever perfect. Give us each a mind of earnest repentance. Provide every heart with sincere words of confession. Lead us all to live holy lives before you and before one another. Enable us as your children to carry the good news of new life in Christ through your words and your deeds to those who do not believe, those who are near us and those who are across the world from us. Father, there is so much that yet lies before us in this coming year. Go before us to settle our hearts on this day and every day. Free us from the fears that turn our eyes back onto ourselves, that we may be able to see clearly with the new eyes that your spirit places within us. Send our worries away through the deep worship of our sovereign Lord, the only one who is worthy of our hope. Father, I ask now that you would ease the burden of the families who are mourning a great loss today. May they hear the quiet of your voice and they find rest in your promised presence. Comfort those who are in the midst of suffering, who feel overwhelmed by the realities of life. 
Father, comfort those who are wounded through broken and lost relationships. May all who are weary hear your call to come to you and to find rest in you. Father, this is a season for struggling for many among us. Father, we pray for those with prolonged illnesses, hospitalizations, for those that are preparing or recovering. Father, I pray for those who are experiencing the many momentary afflictions that through you prepare us for the eternal weight of glory that is beyond compare. Open our eyes to see what is beyond us. Lift up our heads to see the wonder of all that is to come. Lord, bless the proclamation of your living word this morning both here and across the world. May the good news of salvation in Christ ring loudly on this glorious Lord's day. By your spirit, we pray. Amen. Now I would invite you to stand for the reading of God's word. Our scripture reading today is from Hebrews 3 in the English Standard Version. Therefore, holy brothers, who share in the heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as a builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house. If indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope, this is God's word. Please be seated. One of the games my children love to play is called Would You Rather. Would you rather eat a bug or a worm? Usually, that's about the level of the questioning. <laughs> Deacon for Christmas got a book called Would You Rather. I think it's some grown-ups attempt to raise the bar on the questions from insects and arthropods. Would you rather get knocked over by a giant wave or caught outside in a hailstorm? Well, those both sound pretty bad. This one's more fun. Would you rather play hide-and-seek in a dense forest or play hide-and-seek in a cornfield with corn stalks taller than your head? The writer of the Hebrews, this preacher to his audience, is faced with a difficult would you rather type of question. Would you rather have Jesus with persecutions or Judaism with political comfort and safety? Would you rather have Jesus than worldly cares? Would you rather? I was at the national meeting of the Evangelical Theological Society meeting this year that passed in Denver. And I went to a session led by John Piper. Some of you heard of, have heard of him. And he opened his talk with a statement that I probably will never forget. He said, I fear that for thousands, a heaven devoid of pain a heaven of comfort, yet devoid of Christ, would be perfectly acceptable. A heaven of comfort, devoid of Christ, I fear for thousands, would be perfectly acceptable. 
the audience is tempted to go back to Egypt, to go back to the Mosaic dispensation, to forsake their Lord, they are tempted, the very difficult, would you rather question. So we're in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And I would invite you to follow along in your Bibles. There's also an outline in your bulletin. You can fill in the blanks. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, holy brothers. Now, when you take Bible study methods, one of the first things they teach you is that whenever you see a therefore, you should ask yourself, you know this. <laughs> what is it there for? Almost always, it's a tie to the preceding context. And we have to admit, friends, that Hebrews is a sermon, and it's a very strange thing for us to chop a sermon into 16 little bits and hear it one by one. What if we took this sermon today and chopped it up into, into little bits and spread it out over weeks, what would happen? Well, you may learn a lot by analyzing this sermon this way, but there would be loss. There would be loss of being able to hear the flow of argument. There would be loss in being able to hear repetitive refrains that, that come back around like preachers do. And so we must pause and think about with therefore the previous context. So in chapter one, the writer says, in the past, God spoke to us through the prophets in the Old Testament, but now he's speaking to us through his son. And then he goes and he talks about how awesome Jesus is, superior to everything in the Old Testament. In fact, the very one whom the Old Testament is pointing to. Then he goes on. He goes on and says, you know what? You're, you're impressed with the angels. They are impressive Glorious beings, but remember, they're just ministers, they're servants, they're helpers to the king of heaven. And we get this grand view of Jesus, the creator, the heir of all things, the immortal one who cannot fail. And then, I, and then in chapter 2, he says, therefore, because of all this, we need to pay close attention to this, lest we drift. How can we neglect this great salvation, friends? Pay attention. He's greater than the angels. And last week we talked about how he's not just this amazing being, this greater being with a greater office, but he has a greater ministry. And we learned about this long dive as the Son of God comes from heaven to become human, to go through humili humiliation, to taste death for everyone, so that he, like Moses, can lead people out of slavery to sin and death and the devil. Amazing story of the gospel that he's diving down and he's bringing up with him a group of people, a new humanity. And you know what? We're so close that he can call us brothers. God is our father. Christ is our brother. And we are a family of brothers and sisters. Then he says to us today, therefore, because all that is true. And then he addresses them as holy brothers. We could... We could preach all morning on three words. Therefore, holy brothers. How can you possibly, O oh sinner, be called holy? Only because of what Christ has done. How can you possibly, murderous, thieving, adulterous people, be called brothers and family if Christ, your elder brother, did not turn your sin around into reconciliation and love? Therefore, holy brothers, look around, my friends. Look around. Look around. Look around. Literally, look around. This is not a, a, a little, like, metaphor or something. Look around the room. Therefore, brothers and sisters, holy. You who share in a heavenly calling, now he's going to give us something to do. Consider Jesus. Consider. This word is interesting. And in my opinion, I love the ESV. It comes, it comes to just, just a little weak. Here's our, yes, it's a thank you. It's the first um, bullet point on your outline. Consider Jesus. 
We really need in our brains, in our minds, the word has to do with envision, imagine, meditate on, contemplate, let him consume your thoughts. May you become engrossed. You know what it's like to lose yourself in your work? To achieve flow. When you look up, you look at the the clock and, and three hours have passed by and you have no idea where has the time gone. Because you have been considering something and you have lost sight of everything else. The, the author says, consider Jesus. May he fill the vision of your mind. What should we consider about him? Several things. Consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. Interesting. Apostle means sent one. And we've already been talking about that in chapter 2. Jesus Christ was sent by God the Father out of his great love and grace for us. He's the sent one. He's not just sent. He's sent with a message to tell. The story of the gospel, and he himself is that message in its completeness. He is an apostle, but he's also a high priest. And the idea of high priest now has to do with representation between humans and God. So apostle is God sends a message by an apostle to humans. Now the high priest represents the humans to God. And so we have this beautiful reconciling across the gap which has been torn through our rebellious coup in the Garden of Eden. He is an apostle and he is a high priest of what? Of our confession. Our confession here refers to the story that we participate in as believers. The story that we participate in as believers. When you say, sign me up, I want to be a Christian, I give my my heart to Jesus, then you enter in by adoption into a new family. This is your story. This is your confession. We take you into the waters of baptism and you confess that this is your story. This is your confession. I'm a part of the family. I'm one of his. We were just singing it a moment ago, weren't we? Encouraging one another, singing to one another, this is my story, this is my song. I count myself as one of his brothers or sisters in Christ. He is the apostle and high priest of our confession. And then the the writer is going to say, talk about his faithfulness, who is faithful to him, that is God the Father, who appointed him. Just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. So the writer is going to set up a little comparison contrast thing with Moses now so that we can learn some things. Learn some things. Remember, they love Moses. Moses is their hero. They're looking to go back to Moses. And so the writer is going to say, yeah, let's, let's take a look at Moses. Jesus is like Moses. He is faithful like Moses. He's a hero like Moses because Moses too was an apostle. The choir was just singing it so in such a catchy way we couldn't help but sing along. God is sending Moses as an apostle to Pharaoh with a message. What is it? Let my people go. He's an apostle. But as we continue to read the Moses story, we also realize that Moses is a great prophet, giving words from God to the people, but he's also a type of priest, representing the people to God up on the mountain. And when God is is about to destroy them and start over with Moses, he stands there and he intercedes and he says, no, what will the nation say? They'll say you just brought them out to kill them in the desert. As not good for your reputation, God. And he's pleading to God as a priest, as a high priest. Amazing man. The leader of an exodus, faithful to God in God's house. Jesus is faithful like that. There's lots of similarities in the Bible between Moses and Jesus. But there also is a contrast in this text Keep reading. Verse 3. For Jesus had been counted 
worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And so the, the preacher introduces an illustration. Think about a house. What's greater? Well, when you look at a house, more visibly the glory of the house is amazing. The most beautiful building I think I've ever been in is Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. It's stunning. And I'm sorry to admit to you that I don't actually know who built it. I don't know the name of the chief architect. I could Google that. But that wasn't what was on my mind when I was there. And yet there were people, there were people who planned that thing, who engineered its craft to make this soaring building that's designed to lift the worshiper's gaze to heaven, the builder of the building. Now it's tempting, you know, you want to go back to Moses, you think he's great, but guess who created Moses, friends? And so on this little turn, he did this with the angels. Oh, you think angels are great? Guess who made them? <laughs> he expects their worship. Think Moses is great? Yes, he is. But who made him? The builder of the house is greater than the house. There's also a contrast between a son and a servant. And we did this with the angels too. Don't forget that there's royalty in the palace, even though those, those servants of the palace are super fancy and have awesome clothes and amazingly glorious hats. They're servants. Those hats are not the crown. And so when you consider Moses, you must consider also that he serves God's house. And he's interestingly turning the house to refer to God's people now. He serves God's people as a servant. Jesus serves God's people as a son. He is the heir. He is the prince. But I want you to notice what the preacher doesn't do. In this text, the preacher does not throw Moses under the bus. He could have. If you read the Old Testament, you know that Moses' rap sheet is not perfect. Comes through as a sinner, big sinner. Doesn't even get to go into the promised land because of discipline. I think it's interesting that the, that the preacher decides not to point that out. He, he leaves Moses his faith intact as a thing that is heroic. And as he leaves it intact, he also positively says, but Jesus is greater. He does not tear Moses down, oh no. Nor will he tear down the saints throughout the book of Hebrews. In fact, when you get to chapter 11, he's going to take you on a tour of the hall of faith and he's going to pray out all of these messed up sinners who somehow had faith given to them, to them by God as exemplary and helpful for them to persevere. <laughs> He does not tear down the heroes. He simply and elegantly shows how Jesus is greater. But we also need to take a careful look at verse 5. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant. How and what was he doing? To testify to the things that were to be spoken later. To testify about the things that were to be spoken later. And if you read again in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy 18, 15, Moses says this, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Moses is a pointer. He's a sign. So if you think that you're going to honor Moses by going back to Judaism, you don't honor Moses because what does Moses want you to do? Listen to the prophet that is coming like him. Listen to him. Some of you have probably made the long drive across South Dakota from east to west. It is an interesting drive. Lots of billboards on that drive. Wall drug. Wall drug. Keep driving. Wall drug. You're like, I have hardly anything to look at right now except these signs. Wall drug. 
Thankfully, it's broken up. You finally get to the Badlands. That's super cool. You can go to Mount Rushmore, etc., if you want to. But if you don't stop at Wall Drug after seeing almost 300 signs saying Wall Drug, you'd be like, what? What did I, what did I miss? But even weirder, it would be if you, if you just like parked it at one, of the, at one of the billboards and just like, oh, it's just so amazing. It's a masterpiece. It's a work of art. <laughs> you missed the point. The sign wants you to go to the ultimate tourist trap of the world, which is Waldra. <laughs> Moses wants you to be looking for Jesus. He's a servant. He's a pointer. And he's going to expand in his sermon on this. He's going to take you a tour of all the Old Testament furniture. And you're just going to go through the Old Testament. He's going to be like, see, look, Jesus. See that, Jesus. See that, heaven. See that, Jesus. See that, high priest, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. What's his point, friends? Because if you're going to have to go into persecution, you need a grand vision of Jesus that makes the pain worth it. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. And then what's going to happen is that the things of this earth, of this world, are going to grow strangely dim. In the light of his glory and grace. He's the point of heaven. Let's talk on a little bit about the faithfulness of the house. Verse 4. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. And he continues to talk about Christ is faithful over the house as a son. And we realize we're in the household of God. And I want here at UCC for that to be a predominant and identity forming and mission forming metaphor that you can really sink your whole life into. My church family, my brothers and sisters in Christ, my mamas and papas in the faith, my aunties and my uncles in Jesus. Because it's a rough world out there, my friends. And we face a lot of pain and suffering, but we don't have to go it alone. Why? Because in this trust in Christ and in this family of faith, we are then told, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. So that's your second point on your outline. If indeed we hold fast to our confidence and our boasting in our hope. It's a very uh, difficult to translate phrase in Greek. Are there two things here, confidence and our boasting? And are, are there three things in our hope? What, how exactly do they flow together? First, we need to note that hold fast is going to be a repeated idea in Hebrews. Pay attention don't neglect, don't drift, hold fast, hold fast to Jesus, hold fast to the gospel. It comes up in, in chapter, in, well, 3, 6, 7, 11, just keep saying, hold fast. If we hold fast, we are part of his household. This is a doctrine here of perseverance. We don't have time to unpack. But if you think about the parable of the soils, that Jesus shared about the, the, the seed of the gospel falling on different types of ground. The preacher's worried about the, his sprouts. Are, what kind of soil are they in? Are they going to harden their hearts as the weeds come up? Or will they persevere and bear much fruit? Will they hold fast? The idea of confidence or this, this confidence has to do with a courageous attitude. Which is needed when you're fearing persecution and privation and discomfort. But that the gospel, that Jesus himself can give us this boldness, this, this courage, that it would actually cause us to boast in our hope. Boasting is something we actually train our kids not to do. Don't be bragging. Nobody likes somebody who's always bragging all the time. Don't be tooting your own horn. Don't be patting yourself on the back. Good, very good advice. But it's interesting how much the Bible talks about boasting in our Lord. That we're going to brag about our Savior. It's a speech act which is confident and hopeful. 
And that as we consider that the hope is not just hope in hope and some vague idea of, oh, I sure hope things get better. I sure hope it's a sunny day tomorrow. I sure hope in hope. No, it's hope in something very specific. It's hope that the king of glory, the savior of the world, has indeed redeemed us from sin, death, and the devil, and that we have a future with him forever. It's a hope full of content, full of story that can give us the courage that we need to tell people about it, to tell one another this, to tell our coworkers who don't know Jesus yet, to tell our fellow classmates who don't know, that we testify, that we boast in our hope. So we hold on to this. Later in the book, it's gonna talk about how this hope is a, a soul anchor. So we were talking a little bit about drifting people, drifting from the faith. We need an anchor. It's beautiful. So, fantastic text. Well, let's talk about some applications. Some application questions for us today. The first question that I want to ask you are, what do you think are some practical ways to have your thought life more absorbed with Jesus? What are some practical ways to be fixated on Jesus? Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do your job well. Ah, oh, sorry, I crashed the airplane. I was just thinking about my Lord and Savior. No. It's not what that means. But it means that you are obsessed with something. And it affects the way you talk and the way you live. Don't you love being around young lovers? They're obsessed with each other. Now, you can either find that cute or mildly annoying. <laughs> I find it cute. What I really love is when I meet really old lovers. So, we're about to celebrate a wedding. Everybody's giddy about it. Two coming together, and what do they want to tell? They want to tell the story of their love. They want to tell the good features of their beloved. They have thoughts that even though when they have to fly a plane or do their job or whatever, they have, they have a picture of their beloved, and they can't wait to return to him or return to her. And so there's this, there's this, in, there's this vision in the mind of a great love. So what are some practical ways? What are some practical ways that, that we can be absorbed with the beauty of our Lord? Well, as Pastor Mark mentioned in the children's sermon, we have got to love his word. Is it precious to us? The wonderful words of life, because they are from our Lord and our Savior. I would like to read over my, the notes that Deidre wrote me in, in our courtship, they're precious to me. She sends me a little text message and I get excited. I like communicating with my love. Bible reading, of course, but also scripture memory. Are we locking it into our heart? Can we quote our friend? Let me tell you what my friend says about this. He's awesome, super wise. He's got great advice. Let me share with you. And just comes flowing out of us. His word is a treasure hidden in our hearts. Prayer, of course, is communication, talking to our Lord. And it's hard, isn't it? We struggle with prayer. So we must needs figure out how to grow in prayer until there's an affection in prayer and a warmth in prayer. And that's a, it's a discipline, but it is something where many saints have testified that they have grown to love. What about the things that like get into our minds that really, that really affect us in our thoughts? Have you ever gotten a song stuck in your head? Happens all the time. The catcher it is, the harder it is to get out of there. But one way that you can have your thoughts more absorbed with Jesus is to get the right kinds of earworms worming in your ear. So listen to those songs on repeat until they're memorized. And you'll catch yourself throughout the day, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Amazing. Amazing. I love Michael Card. Maybe you, some of you don't know this about me. I love Michael Card. 
I was listening to Michael Card this week. He's singing from his, uh, the title song of his Soul Anchor album is about the book of Hebrews. It's beautiful. And he's riffing on this theme that's repeated in Hebrews. Hold fast. Draw near, hold fast, draw near. It's a soul anchor. Hold on to hope. It's a soul anchor. Just hold on to your courage. Before we call, he answers us with hope. Your film choices could fill your brain. Do you know how film sticks with you? It's weird. For good or for ill, watch the right type of film. It'll stick with you. Art that we look at changes the way we, we imagine things. I hope it's pointing to Jesus. The books we read, the shows we watch, the daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly traditions that we participate in, are they helping us fill our minds with our Savior so that we have the affection in our heart for our Lord? But we would be amiss if we're not noticing that the writer of the Hebrews, though he wants people to know that Jesus is greater than Moses, he does not want them to forget Moses at all. So this brings me to our second application question. Second, are your heroes pointing you to Jesus? Are your heroes pointing you to Jesus? We all have heroes. We can't help it. We are imitative creatures. We like to give praise to the people that we honor and adore. Can't help it, whether it's an athlete or a musician or a movie star or a politician. We like it. And you know what? You can't help but talk about it. That's that bragging piece. Oh, let me tell you what's going to happen when Philly steps up. Let me tell you what's going to happen. Love talking about it. So we have to ask, are our heroes pointing us to Jesus? So we need heroes that are good heroes and ditch the bad ones. That doesn't mean that you can't admire people from afar, but if you're obsessed with a hero that isn't pointing you in a Jesus word way, then you've missed it. And if you're obsessed with a hero and you're forgetting that the point of like Moses is that he's a pointer to Jesus and you're just looking at the hero, you missed it too. So we have to look appropriately at Moses to Christ, and we have to look appropriately at our heroes to Jesus. And so I think that you should like, really like, fill your heart and mind with great heroes. One of the reasons why in the men's study I've been on Christian biography for 10 years is because we're trying to fill our hearts and minds with heroes who have lived well, lived lives for the glory of God. The point isn't to learn trivial pursuit knowledge about Jonathan Edwards. The point is to see the glory of God through the life of Jonathan Edwards. So we fill our hearts and our minds with, with dead brothers and sisters in Christ, but we can also fill our hearts and minds with living examples that really encourage us to walk after our Lord. Big brothers and big sisters, we want to be like you. Thank you for being faithful. Show us the way. But you can also have fictional heroes. Great authors give us people to think about that expand our view of Christ. I always think of Aslan, for example, where you have this, the, the ferocity and the strength and the royalty, but also with the, the huggable, soft lion. Masterful image. King Aragorn, the healer king who comes from obscurity to be, to reign. You probably have half a dozen of your own. But we have to conclude, we have to keep going, and I have one more question for you. Third, who do you know who is holding fast to Jesus? Who do you know? And this is the flip question of the one that I asked you in the first sermon, or the second sermon. I was asking you, who have you seen drift away? What was the anatomy and the physiology of their drift? What can you learn from that example? This is the flip of that. Who do you know who's living faithfully and well? Who's holding fast through suffering, through illness, through pain, through bereavement? Who's holding fast to Jesus? I want you to name them. 
Name their actions. Listen for their boasts in Christ. I got a text last week from somebody, a friend of mine who lives far from here. He says this. We went to a funeral of a 22-year-old saint today. It was hard, but incredibly good. My soul is filled up. Here it is. Can't wait to see Jesus face to face. This person's hope of heaven is Jesus and the reunion of the 22-year-old. Yesterday, if you were here, amazing, amazing funeral service for Sharon Snow. Funerals are an act of war. We come in as a militia to belligerently say we are the victors over sin, death, and the devil. Even though there's a casket in front of us, we will sing over it. And our dear pastor proclaimed the gospel belligerently as a captain of the resurrection, preached over the casket of Sharon Snow and talked about our resurrection hope. We will win, my friends. Who do you know who's holding fast? Listen to them, follow them, try to imitate them, and you too will bear much fruit. My hero is my grandfather. I have many heroes. One of the one that I'll choose to conclude on is my grandfather. His name is John Blosser. You know why we named our son Johnny. He's named after Grandpa John. Missionary, faithful man, quiet man, a musical man. And I don't know if he wrote many songs, but the only song that we sing that Grandpa wrote is called My Heart is Fixed. So I want to conclude with this because of this idea of holding fast, being fixed, being stuck to Jesus. My heart is fixed. My heart is fixed. My heart is fixed to thee, O Savior. To thee I'll sing. To thee I'll sing. From thee I'll never waver. I'll give thee praise for all thy goodness. I will serve thee to the end. My heart is fixed, my heart is fixed, my heart is fixed to thee, O God. My nearest and my dearest, faithful friend. You can't just hold on to Jesus. He has to hold on to you. He's your friend. He's your rescuer. And so we say, help me, my heart is fixed. But we also sing, Jesus, hold me fast. Let us pray. Father, we are in awe of your goodness to us, and we thank you for giving us this day to come in and boast together of our hope, and we pray that you give us courage because our knees knock together all the time. We do pray together for our grieving friends that you would encourage them today and help them to hold fast to you because you are holding fast to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray by the Spirit. Amen. Would you please stand? as we proclaim our hope together. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence? Stands above the storm each
trial who sends the waves that bring us nigh unto the shore the rock of christ oh sing There's an elderberry dinner, 5 p.m. Friday, February 10th. The, there's a typo in your UCC news. The, if you use the link, it actually doesn't work. You have to use the link that came in through your email if you want to RSVP. That's February 10th, Friday, 5 p.m. Will you please receive the benediction from Jude 24, 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Go in peace and please greet one another as you go. Amen.